All right, Miss Karen, it was so nice to come in and watch you teach It's a Hummingbird's Life. Um, we're going to take some time now to reflect on that lesson and to think back on your goals for that lesson and what you wanted students to accomplish. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what your goals were for this lesson. So this is the anchor text for this text set on hummingbirds, uh, which is part of a, a larger unit about native animals in Tennessee. So I wanted to pick a strong informational text uh, to, to anchor this, this set. Um, so I really wanted students to be able to build a bank of vocabulary knowledge that was going to be helpful in future texts and to just really start building their knowledge about hummingbirds and, and recalling some very specific and important facts about hummingbirds that again they'll read about later but they'll be able to build upon. So it was really a knowledge and vocabulary building exercise or that was the, the focus of the lesson. So you wanted to be able to build their bank of vocabulary mm -hmm. as they went into other texts about hummingbirds. Um, and also looking at that, that culminating task where they were going to write about their hummingbirds. Yeah, their guidebook. Um, when you think back to this lesson and what we talked about ahead of time, what were some things that you were wanting students to say or do in connection to the vocabulary decisions that we made during planning? So I ended up pulling out six words to teach explicitly. So I taught those at the beginning of the lesson, I mean before I opened the text, so that when students heard them in context they would already have some understanding. So I taught ruby and throat uh, mm -hmm. to help describe what ruby throated hummingbirds mean, and then humming, hover, nectar, and migrate. So I wanted students to be able to recall a definition, restate a basic definition, uh, but really to understand in context and to be able to use that word correctly and precisely in context. So what were some things that you heard students say um, that let you know if they were able to, to do what you wanted? So able to use those words in context and, and use that mm -hmm. vocabulary. So I think some telling moments were at the end of each section, so it's broken into four seasons, at the end of the spring, summer, fall, and winter, I had them do a formal turn and talk where they recalled one important fact about a hummingbird behavior or event or trait that they learned about in that season. And because the vocabulary words that we chose to teach explicitly were really important and relevant in those sections, I was hoping to hear them. It's like especially in fall, that section is all about hummingbirds migrating. And then the summer, it focuses a lot on their diet and talked about nectar. So those were specific places where I was looking for them to use those words correctly. So think about your students in those sections. So think back to that fall section and migration. What are some things that you heard your students say when you did that turn and talk? So what I felt like I did hear them was they could repeat the definition of, of migrate. They understood that it was moving from one place to another. A lot of them talked about, you know, they fly from Tennessee and then to Florida and then mm -hmm. down to Mexico. And a lot of them recalled why, because of the temperature change and the hummingbirds preferring warmer weather. And I would say maybe half of them on their own remember that word migrate, and the others used words like move or flew, and when prompted, almost all of them could use the word migrate. There were a couple of students who had to refer back to the vocabulary wall, and then they saw mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, migrate. So I would say all of them understood conceptually the meaning of the word, and some of them were able to recall it independently. Mm -hmm. So you saw that with the word migrate. Now mm -hmm. think about that word nectar. Yeah, there was, uh, that was a word that they seemed to catch on to quickly. I think they found the facts in that section really interesting and, you know, it talked about how hummingbirds drink from 3,000 flowers, nectar from 3,000 flowers, mm -hmm. and that's the same as if, pe if people were to drink 500 glasses of juice, and I think that was kind of a fun moment for them, and I think they connected to that. Um, so that was one that they seemed to a higher percentage of students seem to be able to recall more quickly on their own. So that was exciting to see. So you heard lots of students using that word nectar. They were able to make some connections um, to, to their own lives in terms of how much water they drink and things like that. 
Um, you also mentioned that you, in our, in our planning conference, that you were really looking to see not just them use those words when, when prompted, but using those words kind of on their own throughout mm -hmm. their discussions. And I think you've mentioned several times that you heard students using those words. Um, I'm going to read you one um, that I caught because you asked me to, to catch some mm -hmm. of these for mm -hmm. you when you were filling in your graphic organizer. She said, hummingbirds are pretty because they have a ruby throat. Mm -hmm. And so she was using that word ruby that you taught explicitly and the word throat. Um, and a lot of the kids, as you were doing the turn and talk, were, were making that reference to their throats, just like mm -hmm. you were. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about that, what are some of the things, and we can look at your student work yeah. as well, because I see you've got it there. Um, but what were some things that you felt like you did in teaching that vocabulary that really helped you see them be able to use those words? And I'm looking right now, I see that word migrate yeah. right there um, on your student work. So what do you think helped them be able to take those words? Because you talked a lot about hearing them be able to use it in mm -hmm. the turn and talk. We can see it in your student work there. So what do you think made that transfer happen and happen so quickly? Yeah. So first I taught the words explicitly prior to the lesson. And I used the, the template that we used in training that included the word, a picture, a definition and then using the word in a context that's hopefully familiar to students. So like throat, when I have a cold, you know, my throat is sore, which is something they probably all said or heard somebody say. And then previewing how that word was gonna be used in the book, the ruby-throated hummingbird, mm -hmm. you know, has ruby feathers on its throat. So I think that kind of front-loading was helpful. So it built their general base of understanding about the word, but it also primed them to understand specifically how that would be that word would be used in this text, um, and then something else I tried to do was to model the vocabulary a lot in my own speech when I was phrasing questions, when I was rephrasing or summarizing student answers, and then in, in the examples I gave in the writing that I did. I tried to recycle those words so that students weren't just hearing them when I read them on the page, but they were also hearing me use those words when I was responding to questions or, or talking with a partner. So I, I would be curious to know how many times total each word was said during the lesson and if that had any correlation with their retention. So you've said several things here. So one is that you felt like making those connections as you were introducing the word to things that they would have, have familiarity with. Mm -hmm. So like with sore throat, saying, you know, yeah. sore throat instead of just throat. And then making those connections and previewing how they would be used in the text. So not only did you give them definitions that they would understand from their own lives, but you also previewed how those words would then be used in mm -hmm. the text. And then you continued to model the use of that vocabulary as you were talking to them and as you were going through the book, and even as you were doing your think alouds and your wonderings. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about those different pieces, how did you plan for those different pieces to ensure that they happened? And what are some things that you want to continue to be mindful of as you plan for future vocabulary instruction? So I think what helps me plan vocabulary for this lesson was first the coaching conversation we had before I taught where we decided on the words that I needed to teach explicitly and that I needed to emphasize. So then I went into my lesson planning with that awareness. Um, and so then as I was preparing my lesson and as I was reading the text, I uh, put little sticky notes on the pages uh, to with little notes about questions to ask or phrases to use or even just the word itself uh, to remind me that that was a page where I wanted to model using that word in the questions I had. So that was helpful because, I mean, I write out my lesson plans, but I'm not going to have it sitting next to me and I'm probably going to forget some pieces. So having the sticky notes in the book was a helpful reminder to me to make sure that I was doing the kind of modeling, especially related to vocabulary, that mm -hmm. I needed to do. So when you think about deciding on those words ahead of time, planning out with your sticky notes, um, how do you think continuing to be purposeful in your vocabulary planning in that way will help your students as you move forward? I think it was so interesting for me to see how 
quickly they picked up and retained these vocabulary words. So it really felt in the end worthwhile for me to take that extra minute to really determine vocabulary words ahead of time, think about how I should teach them explicitly, and then to strategically review them and model using them in my own speech as I was reading. Um, and so like seeing this as an example, so here's some of their tasks from this reading. She wrote here, they migrate mm -hmm. in fall. And so for her to recall that word and use it correctly in context, uh, I think was really telling. Mm -hmm. um, She's got her ruby throat. Too. She does. <laughs> and so here's an, another a student who, for a couple of pictures, just chose to label instead of writing the sentence. Mm -hmm. um, but here, migrate, and she went through a little bit of a map. Um, mm -hmm. And then here's a, a student who's a more advanced writer who wrote, migrate to Florida in the fall because it gets cold. <laughs> So seeing students at different levels, being able to use the vocabulary in context, I think reinforce that this was worthwhile practice. Um, and then this is some work from the next text that we read. So this was the anchor, and then um, the, the next text we read was a narrative text about hummingbirds, and their writing task following that narrative text um, they continue to use those words. Mm -hmm. Hummingbirds like nectar. Nice. So that was really great to see. Um, I like that spelling. Yeah. <laughs> N-E-T-R. Mm -hmm. uh, but she knew exactly mm -hmm. what, what she was yeah. saying with that. She wrote her last sentence, hummingbirds migrate to Florida and Mexico. Hummingbirds are pretty because they have a ruby throat. Um, you know, fly backwards, but she drew the map of them migrating. And so that they were able to learn that vocabulary in a second text, have it rein sorry, in a first text and have it reinforced in a second text, and then to be able to continue to express it in their writing uh, was, yeah, really good for me to see mm -hmm. and makes me want to continue these practices. So not only did you see them take on that vocabulary in their oral language during mm -hmm. your first read, but you saw them continue to transfer that into their writing as you moved into the second read and other activities. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one last question for you before we move to the next section um, of our reflecting conversation today is what do you think might be some other times that you might want to use this type of vocabulary planning in your instruction? Yeah, so it's so easy to think about vocabulary when I'm doing read-alouds and when I'm doing in literacy. So it makes me think more about other subjects that also carry a lot of vocabulary demands, like math. And we're getting ready to, to start a new unit on place value and introducing some new terms related to place value, like hundredth and thousandth, um, and introducing some new models for place value. So. That's probably a setting in which vocabulary is just as important, but I probably wouldn't think about, <laughs> about planning for it as much. So I'd be interested to see if I incorporate the same kinds of vocabulary practices, how that actually helps their mathematical understanding and their ability to articulate mathematical arguments and reasoning. So making that transfer to the math classroom might help them also when they're writing their explanations mm -hmm. for their mathematics. And definitely practices. talking about it. We're definitely working on um, the mathematical practices related to um, argumentation and justifying answers. That's something I've been working on is having more speaking and listening mm -hmm. in math. So if they have more words to use to talk about math precisely, yeah, I think that would definitely help in their explanations, both oral and written. So what do you think might be some ways that you can ensure that you get that focus in your math planning? Yeah, well, I wonder if I could use actually some of the same strategies, like some of the vocabulary cards mm -hmm. with the word and the picture and different sentences in context, and then also just holding myself accountable to using the words correctly and modeling that. Um, and in some ways, because math is so hands-on, they may even have more opportunities to use terms appropriately. So 
yeah, I think that would be really exciting and really beneficial for them. Great. So using some of those same strategies mm -hmm. and just transferring them over there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit because you asked me also to look at differentiation in your lesson. So let's talk a little bit about the differentiation piece. Um, and as we think about differentiation, let's go ahead and think about kind of how you're planning for differentiation in the next lesson as well. So talk to me a little bit about what you did in terms of differentiation in this lesson, and then we'll make that connection across. Mm -hmm. So for this lesson, I was really thinking about supporting my students, um, some of my students who, who struggle a bit more with literacy. So I made sure that there were a lot of opportunities to talk first before uh, putting anything in writing. Um, I knew that that can be a helpful scaffold. So making sure that there are turn and talks uh, during the lesson. And then I also made sure that there was explicit modeling. So I made, I had the poster uh, mm -hmm. that was the exact same design as the then task template that they filled out and had kids kind of through a shared writing process orally generate and tell me what to do. And I also tried to model different methods for showing understanding. Um, so I have students who, you know, can write sentences like this, but I also have students who are still at the labeling phase or pictures and dictation. So um, I wanted to show that all of that was okay, that the most important part of this lesson was recalling facts um, from the story. So, so that first uh, anchor standard for informational text, recalling key details. So since that was the objective, um, I wanted to make sure that they all had a way that they could demonstrate that regardless of their readiness. So um, that was something I hadn't done a lot before. Uh, I'd really just transitioned right to writing sentences, and I think that left some of my students behind. So I think it was affirming for my kids um, to see me, you know, and, and they would give me an idea, and I would ask them, how do you want me to show your idea? Do you want me to draw a picture, or write a word or sentence? And it was some of them chose different ways. So I think that helped them feel successful in the group setting so that they were uh, more prepared and more successful they were doing independent work. So you feel like having them do that talking first mm -hmm. um, really built their understanding and allowed them to be able to demonstrate their progress and demonstrate their understanding in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. All right, so you mentioned how you were really pleased with the ability of your students to be able to um, complete their work mm -hmm. um, and to have some entry points into that work because of the way that you differentiated their activities. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you plan to differentiate for your next lesson. Yeah, so the next lesson is uh, this book, Little Green, and this is actually a poem, and it really highlights the ways that hummingbirds fly. And so I'm excited to read this book because even though it's a pretty simple text, it just has a grade level equivalent of 1.5. I think there's a lot that could be done with it. So there's some interesting vocabulary related to flight. Um, we see the word hover again in this book, but there's a lot of also just good tier two vocabulary of looping and dashing and darting and zigzagging and uh, words that are, are kind of fun in a poetic setting, but also students may hear in other settings too. Um, and then there's so I want to focus on vocabulary, and I definitely want to continue that theme, and I think I can continue to use some of the strategies that I use today to differentiate uh, what's great is a lot of the words in this text really cater well to gestures. So I'm planning on uh, using a lot of gestures when reading to model, so like using my finger of looping and dashing and darting to kind of show, and the illustrations are also really good too for that. Um, but I think that this text could also be used to teach foundational skills, and I think that's a place uh, where there are a lot of opportunities for differentiation because I have some students who, just focusing on the long and short vowel patterns <laughs> is the place where they could use support, and others 
Um, I think there's a lot of inflectional endings. I think that's actually where they're probably ready in their phonics development. And then uh, there's some other more language skills that some of my uh, higher students could engage with. So really why the author uses the rhythm and repetition and how that actually helps the reader understand the flight of mm -hmm. the hummingbird uh, just because of kind of the cadence of the text and the like repeated ing sound. It actually comes across when you read it as kind of like a buzzing and a humming, which is kind of cool. Um, that I think my higher readers could actually analyze the role of, of word choice and rhythm. So um, there's so many places to go when it comes to, to phonics and word recognition, but I'm having a hard time, I guess, visualizing what that looks like to take one text and differentiate it in so many ways. Okay, so when you think about differentiation, you're really comfortable with differentiating those products, right? Differentiating mm -hmm. those tasks. But you were talking a lot about kind of the skills you want to hit in different content and different thinking processes that you might want to cover, like thinking about foundational skills mm -hmm. and how do you integrate that um, within the read aloud that you're doing. So when you think about this read aloud, are you planning to read it just one time, more than one time? What are you thinking about in terms of of kind of how that's going to play out in your lesson. Yeah, so right now I'm thinking about reading it three times. It's really short. It takes maybe two minutes to read it once. So I want to read it once all the way through uh, just so my students have a, a base understanding of the style and type of text. And then when we read it a second time, I think that's when we can really focus on the vocabulary with a lot of those gestures. I worry if I did that during the first read that it would be a bit distracting for students. And then I think the third read will set them up for the daily task, uh, which is actually the narrator in this story is painting the movement of the hummingbird as he's describing it. Uh, so on the last page, it's, it's really neat. You see what the narrator produced. With, with this page, and so I actually think it would be really interesting and authentic for my students to recreate this uh, version uh, themselves and then to talk about it, so to use that as a vocabulary prompt. So to describe, this is how the hummingbird flies. It zigs and zags and it dips and it darts, and I think that mm -hmm. would be a fun way to prompt their oral vocabulary. So. Those are the three reads that I'm planning. Um, but again, I think there's actually so many more. We could do additional reads and, and focus on phonics or language or other pieces. So when you think about doing those additional reads, what do you think those might look or sound like? They probably have to be in a small group setting um, because you know students are at different levels and, and have different needs. So. That'd probably be most appropriate. Um, and honestly, I, I think they could be, you know, some could be done in a guided reading setting, but even while students are, are doing work, I could probably pull a small group, you know, for a couple minutes and do some quick extension work with them with the poem, especially because after the lesson, they'll have strong familiarity with the poem because we'll have recited it multiple times. Um, so yeah, I think it could look a couple different ways. Okay, so thinking about pulling a small group and focusing in on foundational skills, what do you think that lesson might look and sound like? I think, that, yeah, that's a good question uh, because I think there's so much you could do with this poem. Um, and my students, you know, looking at their data and look at their looking at their work, have a lot of different needs, and um, I'm not necessarily sure what the next step is for them when it comes to foundational skills. So, I mean, do you have ideas for what that would look like? So, why don't we look at taking kind of where you're going with that next lesson? And let me dig into that a little bit and come up with a lesson um, and come in and teach that with your kids mm. and let you look and see what that might look and sound like. Um, I think there are lots of different ways that you could go with foundational skills. 
Um, we could definitely look at, you mentioned earlier, those inflectional endings, the ING, mm -hmm. and saying that that was really strong in this. Um, so how about if I go back and dig into your data a little bit and identify maybe some students that could use some help with that um, and put a lesson together to let you see what that might look like to use the same text that you're using in your interactive read aloud to bring in those, those foundational skills. Yeah, that would be so helpful to see because I think at this point it's still a little fuzzy um, how to really be targeted when doing a lesson like that. Mm -hmm. And thinking too in connection to your differentiation. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned before that you feel really confident with the differentiating by product and, and being able to create some scaffolds mm -hmm. that get students to be successful with kind of the same task or a similar task. So really looking at kind of how do we also then differentiate by content or process. Yeah. Um, I think that'll be interesting for you to look at and, and think about. Yeah, that will be good. That's a good place for me to grow. All right, so thinking back over all of the things that we've talked about today, um, what are some practices that have solidified for you mm -hmm. that you know you want to continue to do? Um, and then what might be some things that, that you want to continue to ponder or think about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm glad you you asked that first question because, I don't know, I think sometimes I get stuck in, like, what do I need to change and what do I do differently? And I don't always persist in practices that actually are effective. So I want to be intentional about continuing a lot of the explicit vocabulary instruction that I did in this lesson, um, the explicit upfront teaching of vocabulary words in that align with text and task, and then intentional modeling of how to use those words when I speak and write, and then making sure I'm asking questions that give students opportunities to use those words themselves. Um, as far as what I'm thinking about, I think differentiation is a big piece. Uh, I think we've made some progress, specifically thinking about how to differentiate the, the products, the, the specific tasks that we're asking them to do. But um, I don't do much to differentiate content or the, really the process that students are engaging with content. So. I'm excited to see you do that uh, and to talk more about that mm -hmm. and then to think about ways that then I can start doing that more. All right, so it sounds like you're going to continue to work on that explicit vocabulary mm -hmm. instruction. Um, you're going to continue to do that modeling in your classroom um, and then we're going to start to look at some, some opportunities to differentiate maybe in some different ways. Mm -hmm. That sounds great, Liz. All right, well thank you so much for taking time to reflect with me today and and to also think about the differentiation piece. Um, and I look forward to coming into your classroom and working with your kids. Great, thanks, Liz. All right, thanks, Karen.